Welcome to Mastering the Attention Economy podcast. I'm your host, Ari Lewis. Twice a week, we interview entrepreneurs, executives, and industry leaders on how to break through the noise and capture the audience's attention. Today's guest is David Nemitz. Dave is an entrepreneur and expert on media startups and building audiences. He is the founder of two digital media startups, Bleacher Report and Inverse. Currently, Dave leads the culture and innovation portfolio for BDG Media, a leading online media company. Hey, all right. Thanks for having me. Dave, thanks so much for joining. Really appreciate it. So, you know, you have a storied career in, um, you know, in media. Um, you know, the first question that I really wanted to, to talk with you about is, you know, you tweeted something um, a few weeks ago about how the future of media is going to be direct to consumer. Can you talk more about that tweet and sort of why you think that's going to happen compared to, you know, your previous brands that you've built have been, you know, relying on SEO and, and the other the means that you think are going away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is, I mean, it's something I think about a lot. Uh, and I think it's, it's honestly, it's a trend that's coming to focus. I mean, direct to consumer, everyone, you know, is, is very focused on it and talks about it. Uh, but within media, uh, you're seeing, you're seeing it more and more, but it's honestly, it's something that's been around for a while, just hasn't gotten the attention. Um, and yeah, just to, you know, kind of give a, you know, an example from, you know, early in my career, I co-founded Bleacher Report. Um, you know, we you know kind of built it from very small, driven mostly by search, to one of the largest sports websites around. You know, still still going strong today. And you know, back in those days, and I think even over the last like ten years of of digital media, you know, most of the focus has always been around growth and around distribution. You know, we were you know Bleacher was early on driven by SEO. You know, later driven by by social growth. You look at brands like you know, BuzzFeed, just like growing massive off social, um, you know, the, you know, distribution is sexy. You know, people love, you know, kind of talking about distribution. People love, you know, talking about the the growth hacks for getting their content out there. But the thing that really makes brands sticky, that makes, you know, builds, you know, kind of real equity with audiences is having that direct audience relationship. Uh, and I think too many media brands, all they focus on is distribution. They don't solve that that direct to consumer piece that really allows them to own the customer relationship. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, we've seen so many media companies grow huge and then disappear or, you know, kind of never quite be able to make it to, you know, kind of really, you know, a sustainable point. Uh, and just to get back to Bleacher Report, I mean, we, we no question, we were built off of, uh, you know, mass distribution. You know, we, we, you know, really figured out how to grow uh, using search. But the key for, for Bleacher Report's sustainable growth and what really allowed it to get over the hump was first launching a, a pretty massive, sophisticated email newsletter program, uh, which, you know, we launched back in like 2008, 2009, uh, which really became like the stickiest part of uh, the Bleacher Report experience. Uh, and then, then launching uh, the Bleach Report app, uh, you know, which was you know, kind of one of the the earliest sports apps in uh, the iOS store, you know, which really, I mean, you know, today it's still so many people use it as their main conduit for getting sports news. So thinking about how you can kind of, you know, you always need distribution to build your audience, but you know, if you don't have a strategy for then leveraging that distribution to build that direct consumer relationship, you know, you're never going to be able to win in media. So, you know, talking about that leverage, one of the things that I know you tweeted about that was a big regret for you was not investing more in individuals. You, you know, you want, you've seen sort of the shift from the platform used to be more important to now the individual is more important. You know, how are individuals going to become more of that direct to consumer relationship? You know, I know you've talked about Cameo and that's a way to strengthen the relationship. You know, where else do you see sort of leverage points for these individuals, you know, everyone from the person starting a sub stack to the, the million person follower on Instagram, you know, what are the leverage points and inflection points for them to, to build that direct to consumer relationship? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, what we're seeing right now across the board is this like, you know, un unbundling of the audience relationship that, you know, all, you know, whether it's celebrities, influencers, journalists are, are able to amass on different platforms. It could be Twitter, it could be Instagram, you know, it could be YouTube, you know, into more directly monetizable relationships. So, I mean, you know, I think, uh, you know, I give a lot of credit to The Athletic uh, for figuring this out early and really, you know, identifying that, 
you know, there was this, this, you know, large segment of creators, you know, in this case, you know, beat reporters, you know, local beat sports reporters who were really undervalued. They had big influences and big followings. They were just, you know, frankly, working for the wrong companies who, you know, could, you know, weren't able to really, you know, figure out how to, you know, kind of put them in the right position to succeed. And, you know, who had all sorts of, you know, systemic, you know, kind of issues that, that were, you know, challenging their business models. So the athletic figured out how to, you know, kind of take those beat reporters, leverage the followings they had to build a really strong subscription business around them. I think now we're seeing that, you know, kind of in a more decentralized way with Substack, uh, you know, or, you know, kind of anyone, you know, who's a, you know, an interesting writer with a good Twitter following, you know, is, is kind of, you know, able to go start a Substack and, Certainly not everyone can, you know, kind of build one that's going to be a, a top, you know, kind of, uh, you know, on the top of the Substack leaderboard. But like, there's enough that it's creating that magnet to pull more people there. And uh, yeah, I think there's some really interesting things happening. You know, kind of more in the, like the entertainment lifestyle, uh, you know, influencer space with with OnlyFans and uh, you know Patreon uh, and, and Cameo. Um, so you know, this is all kind of you know whether it's giving individuals or giving companies, you know, kind of those direct paths to, you know, have a direct relationship with the consumer, you know, where you can either monetize that directly or you can kind of build, build uh, revenue products on top of it. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research on is, is Barstool's model and sort of how they build the platform, but then they give people the power to, you know, launch these individual brands. And, you know, if they do really well, Barstool will either reward them or, or they'll go out on their own. You know, one of the things that I've seen um, people talking about in the media industry is, you know, platforms sort of co-writing and co-owning newsletters with writers that are really popular and allowing them to, to launch on their own. You know, what, what do you think of that type of model? Do you think that's something that takes away from these platforms, right? If you relaunch Bleacher Report where, you know, maybe you have no employees and it's all like independent contractors and you co-own you know, their newsletters. Do you think that's a, a model that works? You know, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I'd be really interested to see, you know, someone try it. I think, I think there's, there's definitely a pathway for that. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Substack gets a lot of attention, um, deservedly so. I think, you know, they built a really interesting platform. They've attracted a lot of talent, but they're not the only, they're not going to be the only platform that's, you know, kind of great for, for independent creators. I think, you know, to start your own Substack, you still kind of have to do a lot of, you know, a lot of your own pick and shovel work to build an audience. I mean, usually, you know, most people who start one already have an audience on Twitter or somewhere else. Um, but, you know, you really, it, you know, you, it's it's really on you to kind of build it and turn it into a business. That's great for some people. But, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of journalists, a lot of creators, whether they're, you know, they're more up and coming, whether they have, you know, kind of, they, they want to you know go for a safer path they, they're they're going to want more you know more of a support structure but still kind of have that ability to be a little bit more entrepreneurial and independent so I think there are going to be you know kind of new alternatives coming out for you know kind of those those types of creators and for you know just you know reimagine type of media businesses that that uh, you know kind of put the the creators first uh, but then still provide all the services and, and kind of support that you would expect from a media company. Do, do you do you think that a lot of content creators fall sort of they fall into two types of or I should say media people fall into two types of buckets? You're either a content person or like you're a business operations person. And it's very rare to sort of see you know um, both those types of things combined. Is is that a is that too much of a stereotype or or would you say that's fair in in, in my assessment of that? Uh, I think it's rare to have both skill sets and be able to really excel at them and kind of, you know, switch contexts. I mean, you look at, you mentioned Barstool, like, you know, the key inflection point for Barstool was, you know, they had, you know, kind of the, you know, the, you know, idea and the community and kind of the sheer like brute force will of, of Dave Portnoy to kind of get to a certain point, but, you know, he really didn't have like the operator business mindset. So, you know, you take the churn in investment, you bring in Eric and Ardini, and then all of a sudden it, it turns into just, you know, an absolute monster. Um, so I think having that, you know, kind of combination in one person is rare. I think, you know, there's there's a reason that a lot of the top people on, you know, Substack, you know, who are really, you know, kind of building, you know, kind of individualized businesses around themselves are, you know, sure they're creators, but a lot of them come from the business world. A lot of them are, you know, kind of come from like 
a more of a, a Silicon Valley entrepreneurial mindset. Not all of them, but but a lot of them. Um, but you know, there are a lot of other creators in the world who just want to be able to create. You know, want to have the platform to do that, and you know, want to have kind of the the operational support that that allows them to you know to do that. And, you know, to kind of make the most that they can out of it. Yeah. So I guess on that note, you know, we talk about bundling and unbundling. Where do you sort of see those people who are unbundling, you know, can they succeed in the long run as individuals or do they need some type of support system? And and do you anticipate, you know, and I know we talked about this before we started recording, you know, the creator economy, passion economy, whatever word you want to use, do you sort of see a whole infrastructure being built up where the, these folks will work with people, whether it's, you know, they need an editor, they need health insurance, you know, what, what, what's your vision and, and sort of thoughts on, on the future of that infrastructure being built around that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's going to work for some. And I think that's like the, you know, Ben Thompson proved this a long time ago, but, you know, he's a, you know, he's an outlier. And, you know, it's taken, you know, maybe a little bit longer for a lot of other people to see that, hey, you don't need to go work at a large publication or media company if you're you know creator if you have a following you can kind of build a you know one person media company around yourself and like you know build it up enough to you know kind of support yourself on an individual basis um you know which um but that's only going to work for so many people uh and you know it's it's great if you're ben thompson if it's great if you know you're uh you know kind of someone who's you know already well known but you know if if you're you know, if you're young, if you're, you know, fresh out of journalism school or whatever, if you're just, just getting started, um, you know, there's, it's, it's a different path. Uh, and, you know, it's, you know, sure, you know, anyone, you know, with enough, you know, hustle and, you know, kind of work and like build up a following on social and kind of, you know, try to get their foot in the door. Um, but, you know, for some people, you know, they, you know, kind of, they need to have, you know, those, those opportunities to, you know, to, kind of get their feet wet uh, and, and get the support they need to grow. So, you know, I think, you know, I think, you know, media businesses will continue to, you know, kind of play that role. Um, you know, they just might start to look a little different as, uh, you know, kind of they, they need to compete with, you know, the, the sub stacks of the world. So, you know, shifting our focus to, to Bustle and you guys, you know, at Inverse were, were, were purchased by, by Bustle and, and you work for the flagship you know, company that, that owns Inverse now, you know, what, what is, what are, what is your approach to making sure that, you know, your content's being read? How are you guys thinking about it? Um, and, and, and what are, you know, are, 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 are sub stacks and, and these, these individual creators more the threat for the future, or are you guys still worried about, you know, more the, the larger platform companies as, as your bigger threat? Yeah, so so uh, Bustle and you know the BDG Media Group, you know which which Inverse is a part of. You know we have eight brands. Uh, you know I've I've uh, you know since since uh, Inverse uh, was acquired about a year ago, I've been overseeing Inverse along with uh, uh, Mike.com and uh, an Input Magazine, which is a newer brand we launched uh, six months ago. So more focused on kind of the culture and technology side, um, and you know we're we're competing with the buzzfeeds of the world we're competing with you know group nine uh you know we're comp- competing with with vice and refinery so you know in in a sense you know we're we are kind of you know still in more of that like you know audience scale in in large you know verticals mindset that you know kind of a lot of like i'd say the, the last decade of digital media uh you know kind of was focused on but you know, part of the reason that that BDG bought Inverse, part of the reason that that we launched Input is kind of we recognize you know where this next phase is going, where it's really more about you know owning these deep niches uh, and really you know kind of you know going as uh, you know, building authority in a niche and going as deep as you can to to build a, a relationship uh, you know with with the customer and with the with the audience that really cares about that niche. So. You know, Inverse, you know, has done that in in kind of the science and fandom space. We sit at this, you know, intersection of like these these geekier topics, which you know are you know are not just for geeks, or you know, it's kind of like geeks are everywhere now. Um, and you know, we've done that, you know, by building out this, you know, kind of, you know, we have a, a flagship newsletter, Inverse Daily, you know, which what just won a Digiday Award, and you know, which just has you know incredible engagement around it, and we've kind of gamified that engagement too. 
um, which has been really effective. And then, you know, we've launched even, you know, kind of deeper newsletter niches. We have a, 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 a newsletter called Musk Reads, uh, which is all it does is, is cover Elon Musk, uh, you know, goes out uh, two or three times a week and we have like 60,000 subscribers to it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in a sense, you know, we, you know, we compete with those big scale media companies, but we also compete with individual sub stacks or, you know, with, you know, influencers on social, it's kind of, you know, all, all media is, you know, kind of, you know, in competition for a limited amount of attention. And I think you win on that just by, you know, kind of, you know, going, going really deep and building authority around, around things that people care about and using that to build a relationship. So, you know, media has always been a horizontal play, right? You have the New York Times or Washington Post covering a wide range of, of different, you know, topics. And now the, this guy, John Yednak, who I'm not sure if you know him, but he t- coined this term sure, yeah. vertical media, which I've been using and I love it and don't know how it's not caught on. But, you know, do you anticipate more folks and more uh, companies taking, you know, that that the approach that you guys are doing where, there's a platform and you just launch a bunch of vertical media companies and, and try to get as deep as possible? Or do you think there is a, a, a opportunity for someone to disrupt the New York Times, Washington Post of the world and, and reinvent a, a new horizontal media company? Um, I mean, I think that there's, you know, anything that uh, the last, certainly the last 10 years and probably, you know, going further back, you know, the history of media shows is, there's a, it's always ripe for disruption, whether it's based on, you know, kind of the, the medium, whether it's based on the distribution, whether it's based on the format. Um, and, but I think, you know, when it comes down to it, people are, you know, while there's constant disruption, you know, it, there, there are just some key categories uh, that consumers are always going to care about. Um, and so it's about, you know, kind of how can you like build the right platform, build the right voice, build the right brand that, you know, kind of, you know, that speaks to that category in a way that, you know, the audiences of today care about. And, you know, that was the idea behind Bleacher Report. It was, hey, you know, the sports fans of, of today, the sports fans, you know, growing up, you know, living their lives on the internet, you know, aren't going to identify, you know, certainly with Sports Illustrated or with, you know, ESPN in the same way as, as you know, kind of fans from earlier eras do. So we're going to build something that's, digitally native in their voice, you know, still covers sports, but just in a, in a different way that caters to them. Um, You know, I think what's, you know, what we're doing at BDG is, you know, kind of building this portfolio, kind of like a, you know, a Condé Nast or Hearst magazines would that, you know, kind of, you know, fits in all these different, you know, kind of, you know, strong consumer passion categories, uh, you know, but, you know, just in, in kind of the, you know, the voice and the format and, you know, kind of the, the form factor that, that works for them today. Um, so I think we're, we're going to continue to see that. And, you know, could someone build something, you know, kind of big and horizontal that, that competes with uh, the New York Times or the Washington Post? I mean, you know, I guess, I guess people have tried. Um, and, you know, BuzzFeed News is, you know, still you know kind of chipping away at that but you know it's 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 tough to do and um you know i think but you know i wouldn't put it past someone eventually to be able to figure it out um so you know i always wrap it up with the last question of you know what is one thing you would do differently so so in your case you know you you joined bustle um if if you were starting over day one what's one lesson or you know one thing you would do differently you know knowing what you know now yeah um i mean i think you know I i would say one thing you know this, this, uh, you know, focus on building, building direct relationships with audiences. It's, I think it's a lesson that even if you, as many times as you learn it, you know, it's, it's easy to get hooked on distribution. And, you know, when I started Inverse, uh, it was about five years ago. I mean, we, you know, we had both, you know, distribution strategy, you know, rooted in, in social and, and search as well as a, you know, kind of a direct audience strategy focused around email. Uh, but you know, I, I, you know, looking back, I would have, I would have gone, you know, kind of further into the email path, uh, and, and not gotten back, you know, caught up in the social side. You know, I think, it, you know, if, if, if there's anything we've learned, it's that, you know, media companies shouldn't, shouldn't get too, too, uh, hooked on social audiences because they're, they're always, uh, you know, they're always going to change or pull the rug out from under you. So I think, you know, it's, you, you always have to, you know, kind of have your eye on how you're building that, that long-term audience. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, if you do that, even if you're starting small, 
you know, ultimately that's, that's the way to win. Well, Dave, I want to, you know, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, for those who are watching or, or listening, you know, where can they, they find you on social media? Uh, so you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Dave Nimitz, uh, and, you know, tweet about media startups and, you know, kind of thoughts about, you know, kind of the future of, uh, you know, where digital media is going. So, you know, feel free to follow me there. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. All right. This is fun. Great. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And until next time.